I am your host, JD Horror, and this is True Crime Horror Story, a true crime podcast designed like an anthology horror movie. It's definitely not for the faint of heart and never played for laughs. Listener discretion is strongly advised. In seasons one and two, we highlighted both notorious and obscure incidents of real life murder. From world famous psychopaths like the Toolbox Killers and the Night Stalker Richard Ramirez, to lesser known evils that you may not have heard of that have effects just as catastrophic for the victims and their families. Season 3 is coming soon, so subscribe now wherever podcasts can be consumed, and check out our website at www.truecrimehorrorstory.com. True Crime Horror Story. Sometimes truth is more brutal than fiction. Hi guys. In order to keep the show ad-free and increase the frequency of production, donations are a big help. Some of you have been very generous in donating, and I appreciate it greatly. If you could give to the show's Patreon account, it would result in good karma and buttress the show's prospects. The URL is www.patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash leader one, L-E-A-D-E-R-O-N-E www.patreon.com slash leader1. Thank you so much. Why do you seem so scared? All I wanted to do was play with you. Please come and play with me. I'm so lonely. You're not afraid of the dark, are you? (laughs) Don't be afraid. Come with me. I will show you where I play hide and seek. Do you want to play hide and seek? You hide, and I'll find you. (laughs) Jerry Brudos was born on January 31st, 1939, in Webster, South Dakota. His family were farmers living in poverty. Because his father was unable to hold down a job elsewhere due to his short temper, he moved them to the Willamette Valley in Oregon. The family continued to move frequently while his father, Henry, looked for work. It was the Great Depression, so this was no easy task. Henry was rarely home. Jerry was left with his mother. She favored his older brother, Larry. She not only viewed Jerry with little more than disdain, but she was very open about the fact that she wanted a girl. She rejected Jerry wholesale. This was devastating for him. It hurt him even more when he saw how she doted on Larry. Eventually, Jerry's pain turned to anger. Jerry came to despise his mother. Years later, he characterized her as, quote, a selfish, stubborn egoist, end quote. A significant event of Jerry's childhood happened when he was five years old. He was at the dump looking for potential treasures that his family could not buy. At one point, he found a pair of high-heeled shoes. He was fascinated, then infatuated. He brought them home. He would wear them around the house. They stood out, not just because he, a boy, was wearing them, but also because his mother never wore heels. His mother, Eileen, was horrified when she witnessed this. She leaned on him to promise to throw them away. She wanted a girl, not a transvestite. Jerry was dumbfounded. To her, the shoes were taboo. He just could not grasp why this must be so. He kept the shoes anyway. When Eileen discovered that he hadn't thrown out the shoes, she burned them and made him watch. This incident left a great deal of residual anger behind in Jerry. His mother destroyed something he loved, and there would be consequences one day. Jerry Brudos had a shoe fetish. That much was clear. His mother didn't burn that away. With the passing years, his fixation on feminine footwear became intensely erotic 
and very much an obsession. His sexual proclivities were informed by his passion for women's shoes and his mother's disapproval of them. He developed a passion for the taboo and forbidden, which only made the shoes more exciting when he managed to get a hold of them. When he became sexually mature, these forces merged and formed something much stronger, something that would transcend mere fetishism and become a force of destruction. It would have helped if he had been able to release his sexual drive with real live girls. The problem was, he was anything but a heartthrob. He was overweight, scarred by clusters of acne, and he was awkward around girls. No matter what the outside world would have thought of his shoe fetish, he faced neither condemnation nor criticism from the shoes themselves, so his monomania would not diminish. By this point, he had stolen a largesse of women's shoes. Obtaining a pair was never easy. After his mother burned his first pair of heels, he tried to steal a pair from his grade one teacher, but he was caught by a classmate. This humiliation was more than he could bear, and he ran out of the classroom. Mental illness wasn't the only malady suffered by Jerry Brudos. As a boy, his immune system was no match for fungal infections. Something was also amiss on the neurological front. He had regular migraine headaches that were so intensely potent he would vomit. Brudos had an average IQ and did not excel academically. His migraines likely made it difficult for him to concentrate. His brother, on the other hand, was a straight-A student, adding yet another reason for his mother to favor him over Jerry. Eileen would browbeat Jerry for his scholastic failures. One day, while still a child, Jerry made another attempt to steal a pair of high heels. Family friends were visiting, and their teenage daughter took a nap in Jerry's bed. He tried to slip the shoes off her feet, but he woke her, and she ordered him to leave the room. Still unsatisfied, Jerry's preoccupation with women's footwear took a new turn when he discovered a box of drawings his brother made. Larry drew pictures of Superman's girlfriend Lois Lane in the nude, high heels as her only adornment. These drawings were hidden from their mother under lock and key. He broke the lock in order to view Larry's homemade pornography. Rather than inform on his brother, Jerry accepted the blame for the material. He knew she would never accept that Larry could be capable of producing such filth. Not Larry Brudos, the earthen saint. Not Mr. Perfect. Never. Jerry Brudos's private life only became worse after his descent into puberty. His mother would tend to his bed linens and find stains from masturbation and nocturnal emissions. She made him wash them by hand. The impact of adolescence didn't just change him physically. His fantasies evolved with the advent of his sexual awakening into something far more macabre than a fascination with high-heeled shoes. Now he began to envision kidnapping girls and holding them with force. They would beg him for mercy in these scenarios. His mother continued to make his life miserable with verbal abuse and playing favorites with his brother. His father and brother didn't know what to do about it, so they stood idly by. Jerry took his fetishes to loftier plateaus. It was no longer just concentrated on shoes. He stole a pair of panties from a neighbor. She called the police, but Jerry was never caught. Jerry's sexual proclivities advanced to another level when an enthusiasm for boudoir photography took hold. He was no mere hobbyist. He was no artiste. This was a portfolio straight out of the diabolically autoerotic. The problem was, he didn't know any girls who would have gladly cooperated with him on this venture. There was no empire of scantily clad and conveniently located amateur models on Instagram from which he could select. 
The plan he concocted was to lure the neighbor girl over to his house. He would tell her he knew who stole her panties and that he would help her get them back. That's the part of the plan he pitched to her. It represented only the tip of the pyramid of detail that remained submerged. He had to sell himself as a safe bet as a harmless boy that would have her over to his house with only the best of intentions. She bought it. When she went to his house, he left her in the living room for a few minutes, ostensibly to retrieve the panties. When he returned, he was wearing a mask. He brandished a large knife. He put it to her throat. Using this as his threat, he forced her to remove her clothes. He took numerous photos of her in the nude. She was trembling the entire time. He left the room. The girl snatched up her clothes and tried to leave. Jerry stopped her. He told her the man in the mask locked him in the barn and that he only managed to escape at that moment. It is not known if the girl believed this story, but she never reported the incident to the police. Jerry examined the photos, the first of what would become a much larger collection. Jerry's propensity for sadism expanded beyond the parameters of pornographic photos and women's undergarments. He now wanted to keep girls as sex slaves. It didn't remain dormant in the realm of fantasy for long. Once at the end of the school day, he offered a 17-year-old girl a ride home. She didn't expect to be driven to a deserted farmhouse. Once there, Jerry tried to strip her of her clothing by force. She refused, and Jerry flew into a rage. He started beating her with his bare hands. A couple stationed at a distance witnessed the attack and called the police. He told them he stopped to help her, but the girl told them the truth. Jerry Brudos was arrested for the very first time. He was charged with assault and battery. Officers searched his bedroom. They found women's shoes, panties, and the photos he took of his neighbor. Because of the nature of the materials they found, they escorted him not to the local jailhouse, but to the Oregon State Hospital, which specialized in psychiatric care. This facility was featured in the film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. The conditions of the environment within the hospital were not entirely dissimilar to those depicted in the film. During his stay in the hospital, Brudos told psychiatrists about his fetishes and how they were increasing in intensity. They dominated his thoughts more and more with every passing day. The doctors decided that his sexual proclivities would prove to be symptomatic of a short-lived phase. They said, He'll grow out of it. He told them he wanted to kidnap girls, place them in freezers, and arrange them in sexually suggestive poses. They didn't assume he was capable of realizing this fantasy. They considered his hatred of his mother to be the cause of this pathology. Little did the psychiatrist know that he was manipulating them. He could play his own psychological games, as he did with police years later. His intelligence and insanity coincided effectively, enabling him to achieve the unthinkable. He told the doctors that he didn't get his kicks from typical teenage boy interests, like sports. For Jerry Brudos, being equipped for a wild evening consisted of a pair of women's shoes, a photograph of an involuntarily naked woman, a stolen pair of women's underwear, and a brutal beating. However, it got to the point where these criteria fell short of what he required to be satisfied. He was diagnosed as borderline schizophrenic. The psychiatrist decided it was safe to send him back into society. Not even his fantasy about freezing women in sexually provocative poses put up a red flag. The advice the doctors gave him? Grow up. After spending nine months in the hospital, he was discharged. If only the doctors had been cognizant of the tragic consequences of this decision. Jerry Brudos felt very sure of himself now. 
He had confessed to disturbing sexual urges and homicidal ideation. And even after all of that, he convinced the staff he was harmless. He looked forward to the day when he would try these tactics on the police. Jerry Brudos struggled to find a job after graduating high school. He was close to the bottom of the class. In 1959, at the age of 20, he enlisted in the Army. The harsh discipline and uniformity of the military wasn't enough to quell his dark sexual fantasies and delusions. It got to the point where he managed to disturb himself. He decided it was time to seek help for the unrelenting, intrusive thoughts. He met with the Army's psychologist. After examining the discomforting contents of Brudos' mind, Captain Barry concluded that he wasn't suited to life in the Army. Jerry Brudos was discharged due to what Dr. Barry called his bizarre obsessions. After leaving the base, Jerry had no other place to go but his family's house. The problem was, his mother was not at all pleased to see him there. She never wanted him there in the first place, and now he was back after she had been relieved of his presence. She didn't kick him out, but she didn't let him sleep in the house either. He was permitted to sleep in their shed in the backyard. It was one rung above living in a doghouse. Once more, he was cast out by his family, with his mother as the cardinal figure in relegating him to the hinterlands of his family's lives. She had done this sort of thing many times, and now it just took on another form. He developed a festering hatred of women, born out of the resentment he felt toward his mother. Little did she know how lucky she was that she wasn't the one to suffer the consequences, grave as they were, as noted in the annals of American crime. 1960 Jerry Brudos tried to kidnap a woman who was en route to her workplace after her lunch break. He strangled her unconscious. He removed her shoes. At home, he slept with the shoes. They were a hunting trophy of sorts. They symbolized his triumph in overcoming the victims who wore them. Brudos' intellectual specialty was electronics. He enrolled at Oregon State University to obtain a radio and telephone operator license as issued by the Federal Communications Commission. While there, he was detained one day by security. If it had been his intention to remain incognito, he failed at accomplishing that objective spectacularly. He was in possession of a gross of women's clothing. He was wearing women's underwear and shoes. He wasn't reported to the police since there was no evidence of a crime being committed. Having completed the licensing program, he was hired by a radio station in the town of Corvallis to work as an engineer. While there, he was set up by one of his co-workers with 17-year-old Ralphine Leon. Ralphine was impressed by Jerry and fell in love with him in short order. He was hardworking and responsible. She became pregnant by him, and though her parents weren't exactly thrilled with the idea, Ralphine married Jerry. Jerry Brudos was a demanding husband. Ralphine was ordered to do all the housework and cooking, wearing nothing but a pair of high heels. He set up a workshop in the basement. Ralphine was forbidden from entering this domain. It was where Jerry kept his cachet of women's underwear and shoes. There was also a large collection of pornographic photos. A few of them featured Ralphine doing housework in the nude. By this time, Brudos was so obsessed with his sexual predilections, it drove him to distraction. It affected his performance at work and took a toll on his relationship with his wife. In 1962, Jerry and Ralphine's daughter, Teresa, was born. The family moved from one end of Oregon to the other, due to Jerry's difficulty in holding down a job. Essentially, Jerry's life became a two-lane highway, with his sexual proclivities taking him in one direction and his wife's frustration with his inability to stay employed diverting him from that course. For a time, it was extremely difficult for him to choose one over the other. Eventually, Ralphine would distance herself from Jerry. 
She was disillusioned that the man she married was not nearly as responsible as he initially appeared. She would not even allow him to be present in the birthing room when their son Brian was born in 1967. He was more preoccupied with his sexual pathology by this point anyway. He continued to steal underwear from women. He would wear panties beneath his clothes. His relationship with Ralphine could never satisfy him like cross-dressing. Jerry Brudos' pursuit of women and their apparel became more brazen than ever. One night in 1967, he followed a woman to her home. She was not aware that she was being followed. He spotted her as she entered her apartment and got settled for the night. When she turned out the lights and went to bed, he sprang into action. He broke into her apartment and riffled through her clothing. Not having found anything in her closet and drawers to satisfy his insatiable appetite for undergarments, he tried to steal a pair of shoes. She woke just then. She didn't get a chance to call the police. He leapt onto the bed and strangled her. Strangulation gave way to rape, and he dealt it with ferocity. Once he was finished violating the woman, he took her shoes as hunting trophies. This behavior was to some small degree spilling over into the rest of his life. His darkest desires were consuming him wholesale. He would leave photos of himself dressed in feminine finery around the house. As if it hadn't been hard enough for Ralphine to accept all this, now their children were at risk of discovering it for themselves. Ralphine still resented him for his desultory employment record, but she ignored the photographs. Jerry obtained steady employment as an electrician in Portland, and the family moved there shortly thereafter. Among the other significant events of 1967, he was electrocuted in the workplace. It was a shock to the tune of 480 volts. Its potency was such that though it didn't kill him, it did leave him dazed and confused. He didn't feel it would be necessary to go to the hospital, and he didn't but he didn't emerge from the experience completely unscathed. The migraine headaches of his childhood returned, alternating with what he characterized as blackouts. Brain damage due to extreme electric shock was the last thing his disordered brain needed. 1968. Linda K. Slauson sold encyclopedias door-to-door. -door. January 26th. Linda made a stop at Jerry Brudos' neighborhood. She had a list of addresses, but the information was blurred by rain. When she passed the Brudos property, Jerry was in the front yard. She asked him if his house was one of the addresses she was looking for. He told her he was indeed interested in purchasing encyclopedias. He told her he didn't want to disturb his family, saying they were upstairs. He invited her to join him in the basement where they could discuss the transaction. Linda followed Jerry into the house. There were no records of her visit to the Brutos homestead, and the police had no valuable leads to act upon. The case grew cold. This is what the police would not learn at this time. Once they arrived in the basement, Jerry pulled up a stool for Linda. After she perched upon it, he rushed up to her from behind and hit her across the head with a two-by-four. She fell off the stool, unconscious before she hit the floor. He checked her vital signs. She was still alive. He finished her off by strangling her with his bare hands. Jerry went upstairs and gave his mother some money. He told her to take his daughter out to eat. Once they left, he returned to the basement. He removed the clothing from Linda's body. He put them back on. She had become his very own Barbie doll, but with this one being a statuesque model of flesh and blood. He would dress her in the clothing and shoes he stole from other women and take photos. He took a break when his mother and daughter returned. He ate with them and then returned to the basement for dessert. Nothing was sweeter to him than women's garments, shoes, and the unmitigated consent availed to him by a lifeless body. Casting a shadow over Linda Slauson's corpse, 
He was clad in some other woman's clothing as he masturbated. If there was a target for his climactic discharge, it resided somewhere in the general vicinity of the young girl's body. He wanted a keepsake, something that transcended the thrill he derived from stealing women's apparel. It was his foot fetish that demanded something new, something organic, something personal. Clothing and shoes were transient items a person discarded once they were damaged or too out of fashion to be worn publicly without embarrassment. He wanted something that promised the uncompromised essence of an individual human being, something that was unmistakably and irrefutably theirs, something like a foot. His foot fetish was no longer satiated by the disembodied footwear of women who only existed in the realm of memory and imagination once they were obtained. He now arrived at the limits of foot fetishism. It drove his hand in the direction of a hacksaw, which he took up and used to cut off Linda's left foot. He sawed and sawed back and forth, back and forth, powering through stubborn bone and muscle until it passed through the other side, that realm from which he would never return. Morals, legalities, and logic were cast out of this twilight between intrusive thoughts and violent ideation, and for Jerry Brudos it was a one-way street leading to a prison as its cul-de-sac. Jerry Brudos, the murderer, necrophile, and pervert, was complete. No further assembly required. Linda's left foot in hand, he dressed it in one of her shoes. He stashed it in the deep freezer. Time is a thief when it comes to perishable items, breaking them down for use as compost to feed new life in its infancy. A deep freezer protects something like a severed foot from the guarantee of such a fate. He wasn't concerned about the foot being found by Ralphine. The contents of the freezer, just like everything else in the basement, was off-limits to her. In the evening, after his family retired to bed, he put Linda's body in the trunk of his car. He weighed her down with an automobile transmission that was attached to her with rope and wire. He drove her to the Wilsonville Bridge and tossed her body into the Willamette River. She sank immediately. Having washed his hands of this incident, he would, on occasion, take Linda's foot from the freezer and fit it into shoes from his collection. Having arranged it just right, he would masturbate. Jerry Brudos was quite taken with Linda Slauson's frozen foot, so much so that it took ten months for the raging inferno of his preoccupation to dwindle down to ashes. This period was enough to keep him from killing temporarily, but dressing Linda Slauson's foot in high heels was now old hat for him, and he craved variety. Only the fresh could displace the stale and the insipid. There were billions of women in the world, and a thousand times as many shoes. The possibilities were endless, as was his diabolical urge to visit violence and sexual impropriety upon his victims. In the meantime, the Brutals family moved to Salem, Oregon. Their new house boasted a large garage, a perfect space for Jerry Brutals to set up a workshop. There was a narrow breezeway between the garage and the house, so privacy was guaranteed. Every serial killer has a Ph.D. in privacy, recognizing the necessity of hiding their nefarious activities from those who do not share their warped predilections. Jerry Brutos was evil and perverted, but he wasn't stupid. Brutos ensured that the garage would be well equipped for these purposes. He outfitted the building with a large, deep freezer. He secured the entrance with a large padlock. There was also an intercom system. He instructed Ralphine to contact him through the intercom whenever she needed to contact him in there. Emergency or not, this protocol was to be observed without exception. He explained that he set up his photographic darkroom and that if she entered at the wrong time, she would ruin his work. If she needed something from the freezer for dinner, she still needed to use the intercom to notify him before entering. 
He would bring her whatever item she requested. She was irritated that her husband acted like a prison turnkey whenever she needed an item from the freezer, and she didn't take inventory of what was in there, so she didn't always know what to ask for. Still, she didn't confront him about it. Like most people, the last thing she would ever assume was that her spouse raped, murdered, and dismembered people. It just wasn't in the realm of possibility, she thought. It's one of those things we all prefer to take for granted. One day, Ralphine made it so she would no longer be able to ignore Jerry's cross-dressing. After pointing out that he had gained weight, Jerry left the room. When he returned, he was dressed in lingerie, a garter belt, and heels. He asked her if this outfit made him look slimmer. It was an exceedingly awkward moment for her, and she dealt with it with nervous laughter while staring at the floor. She said nothing. The next time she saw Jerry that day, he was dressed in men's clothing. They never discussed the incident. Ralphine filed it away in her memory, hoping it was little else than a practical joke. November 26, 1968. Jan Susan Whitney, aged 23, disappeared while en route to her home in Eugene, Oregon, after spending Thanksgiving with a friend. Her vehicle was found off Interstate 5. The vehicle was locked. Her body was not found there. Police found nothing in the car to indicate foul play. Jan Whitney had simply disappeared. The story of how the events unfolded began with car trouble. Two young men were assisting Jan. Jerry Brutos noticed them on his way home from work. Jan was just his type, so he stopped and offered his assistance. He told Jan that he could fix the car, but he would need to go to Salem to get the appropriate tools. He drove Jan to his house, dropping the young men off along the way. Jan waited in the car while Jerry went in the house. When he returned to the car, he got in the back seat, directly behind Jan. He asked her if she wanted to play a game. He told her to close her eyes. He instructed her to demonstrate how one ties a shoelace. That was his distraction scenario. While she was engaged in the task at hand, he took a leather postal strap and strangled her with it. He opened the car door and slammed it so that the strap was tightly wrapped around her neck. Brutos raped her as she perished in the front seat. After his climax and her death, he brought her corpse into the workshop. He dressed and undressed her in some of his feminine garments. He relished the sight of the undergarments from his collection as they were stretched against the curvature of her body. He got worked up again. The lust was more than he could repress. He couldn't help himself anymore. He raped the cadaver of Jan Whitney as it cooled. He didn't place this one in the freezer. He wanted to be assured of her pliability. He strung her up from the ceiling with a hook. Over the next five days, he raped her constantly. He would risk speeding tickets, driving at high speeds, so he could get home from work and rape Jan Whitney's body with minimal delay. He claimed a trophy from this kill. He cut off one of Jan's breasts and filled it with sawdust. He displayed it on a board. He wanted to make a paperweight out of it, and he did cast it in resin, but he got the formulation wrong with disappointing results. Ralphine got a look at the breast and noted how realistic it was. Jerry laughed, saying it was an experiment, which wasn't far off the mark. When he perfected his taxidermy with another breast, he displayed it above the fireplace. Murder and necrophilia became Jerry Brudos's drugs of choice, and he was riding so high he didn't realize how reckless he became. He left Jan Whitney's body hanging in the garage while he took his family on a Thanksgiving vacation. While they were gone, Jerry came dangerously close to getting busted, and he didn't even realize it. A car accident occurred that consisted of the motorist driving straight into the Brudos' garage. Somebody called the police to report the incident. The police responded and took down a detailed report. However much damage was done to the garage door, it wasn't enough to reveal the corpse. The stench of decomposition hung in the air within the garage, 
but it couldn't be smelled on the outside. Lady Luck must have held Jerry Brudos in higher regard than Jan Whitney's ghost, for one of the cops looked through a crack in the garage wall to get a sense of what was inside, and he didn't find anything incriminating. Somehow the cadaver hanging on the hook eluded his flashlight's beam. Since he didn't have a search warrant, he couldn't enter by force, so he left a card with some contact information indicating that they would need to inspect the garage at a later date so that they could finish their report of the accident. When Jerry returned home, he read the card and went to work concealing the body. He wrapped it in plastic and placed it in a small shed behind the garage. He called the police and invited them to finish their business. Coming dangerously close to getting caught excited Jerry. However, he realized it was high time to get rid of her body. He might not be so lucky next time. He dragged her body to his car, placed it in the trunk, and drove her to a bridge, where he dumped her into the Willamette River. March 27th, 1969. Karen Elena Sprinker was a university student home for spring break. She had plans to have lunch at an establishment in downtown Salem with her mother. She didn't turn up. Her mother became frantic after a few hours. The only trace of her daughter she found was her car, which was locked and abandoned on the rooftop parking lot of Frank's department store. Her mother filed a missing person report with the Salem police. She informed them that Karen was too considerate and responsible to run away without notifying anybody first. Because Karen was not a minor, the police had to wait 24 hours before initiating the investigation. Also, there was the possibility that she would show up and give a plausible explanation for why she was gone. When police searched her car, they found no signs of foul play. Potential witnesses were interviewed. Some had been in the parking garage around the time when Karen was abducted. Two girls reported a strange incident they witnessed a few weeks prior to Karen's disappearance. They observed a large woman loitering in the garage. She was fidgeting with her undergarments. She was wearing a dress and high heels. She appeared to be waiting for someone. She kept tugging at her girdle and adjusting her nylons. The reason they reported this incident was because the figure looked less like a cisgender woman and more like a man in drag. It wasn't just their size. They appeared to be uncomfortable in their clothing, as if they were wearing that type of clothing for the first time. There was no way to ascertain if this person was connected in some way to Karen's disappearance. Nevertheless, the detectives wrote it down for future reference. The story, as it was revealed sometime later, was that Karen ran into Jerry Brudos in the parking garage. He had a gun in his hand. She didn't know if it was real or not, but she took the threat seriously. As it turned out, the gun was a toy. On the way to Brudos' house, Karen tried bargaining with Jerry without success. That would have presupposed that there was something in the world he wanted more than her body at that moment. There wasn't. Jerry forced her to dress in several outfits from his collection. Following this, he tied a noose around her neck and attached it to the ceiling through a hoist called a come-along. It is a hand-operated winch with hooks on both ends. It enabled him to increase the tension on the noose while securing the rope in place. He elevated her a few inches off the floor. He went inside to eat and watch a cartoon show. Meanwhile, Karen was slowly strangled by the rope. By the time Jerry returned, she was dead. He decided to try making another breast paperweight. He had been disappointed by his previous effort, so this time he was determined to do it right. He sliced both breasts off. He masturbated as he stood above her body. He dressed her for her last car ride. To prevent blood from spilling onto the upholstery of his car, he placed a bra on the corpse that was filled with paper towels. He clothed her in the plaid skirt and green sweater she was wearing when he kidnapped her. He tied her to an engine block to weigh her down. He placed her in the trunk of his car. He drove her to Bundy Bridge and dumped her into the Long Tom River. 
April 21st, 1969. Sharon Wood, 24 years old, left work early. She had an appointment to meet with her soon-to-be ex-husband to discuss details of their divorce. She was headed to her car, which was parked in the lower level of a parking garage. Suddenly, she heard footsteps behind her. The hairs on the back of her neck stood up. There was a tap on her shoulder. She turned and saw a tall, overweight man holding a pistol. He said to her, If you don't scream, I won't shoot you. Sharon was in no mood for victimhood. She screamed and backed away. He reached out and wrapped his arm around her throat. Sharon kicked him with her high-heeled shoes. She tried to wrestle the gun out of his hands. When he tried to muffle her screams by placing his hand over her mouth, she bit his thumb. He began to bleed. He wrapped his arm around her head and wound it around. He brought her down to the floor and beat her head against it. It left her dazed. Her teeth disengaged from his hand. Sharon's dazed ex machina arrived in the form of a car that entered the garage at the just that moment. Fearing he would be caught, Brudos grabbed the gun and fled. Someone else heard Sharon's screams, and other people who had been in the garage at the time came rushing to her aid. Somebody called the police. They came and took a statement about the incident. She described both the attack and Jerry Brudos' physical features. Nobody else who had been there at the time recalled seeing him. There was a promising lead the next day. A 15-year-old girl from Salem told police about a man who tried to force her into his vehicle. She described him as large and freckled. She said he drove a sports car. Something similar happened to 12-year-old Gloria Smith. He tried to kidnap her as she was on her way to school. She spotted a neighbor working outside in her garden. She pried herself free from Brudos' grip and ran to the woman. Brudos drove away. April 23, 1969. Linda Saley, 22 years old, had just finished shopping at a mall. She encountered Jerry Brudos in the parking garage. 7 p.m. Linda was scheduled to go to her boyfriend's apartment to celebrate his birthday with him. As time went on and she didn't show up, he became concerned. At one point, he drove over to her home. Her car was not stationed in the parking lot and she didn't answer the door when he knocked. Linda's friends and family became worried. The concern escalated into panic when she failed to show up for work the following day. They contacted the police. Investigators found Linda's car in the parking garage. There were no signs of foul play. This looked familiar. Young women were being abducted with no signs of a struggle. This was clearly the work of a repeat offender. All these women who were unable to gain entry to their cars to escape were driven by someone else on a one-way street to the grave. The Grim Reaper appeared in the form of Jerry Brudos and his fake police badge. He told Linda she would have to accompany him to the police station for questioning. He told her it was related to a sudden uptick in shoplifting at the mall. They drove from Portland to Salem, bypassing the police station. He took her straight to his home. He brought her to his workshop in the garage. He tied her up. Feeling famished, he left her that way as he went inside the house to eat dinner. When he returned, he was likely stunned, as anybody else would have been, that she was sitting there calm. She had managed to unbind herself. The explanation for why she didn't escape is unknown. What is known is that he tied her up again. Like with all the others, he hung her from the ceiling. He removed her clothing and took some photographs. Having finished with this latest addition to his portfolio, he choked her beyond unconsciousness into death. He found this easy, as he did with all the other victims. He would remark later that to him, Linda Saley was like a candy wrapper, just an article of waste that he would throw away. That's how much worth her life could boast of in the crosshairs of Jerry Brudos. As far as he was concerned, they started as toys 
and became rubbish to be discarded. They were dehumanized in his mind before the abductions began. He didn't even keep a trophy from Linda Saley. He just dumped her into the Long Tom River. When asked why he didn't cut her breasts off, he said it was because they were pink and that the areolae were underdeveloped. Brutus was always looking to commit the perfect murder, and all details had to be exactly as he envisioned them, from the method of execution all the way down to anatomical minutiae. Jerry Brutus was careless in the way he disposed of Linda Saley's corpse. If he had weighted her down more carefully, she wouldn't have floated to the surface. This was the first evidence police obtained since her disappearance was first reported. He attached a transmission to her body with a nylon cord. A length of red mechanics cloth was tied to the transmission. There were signs of trauma, like a broken hyoid bone, and indicators of asphyxiation. Her family was assured that her death, though not free of suffering, was not prolonged. Police were puzzled by what they observed on Linda's rib cage. Two needle marks. There was one on each side. Each one was surrounded by burn marks. Divers searched the river for days to find other clues about Linda Saley's death. In the process of doing so, they found the body of Karen Sprinker. Like Linda, she was weighted down with automotive parts. A red mechanic's cloth was attached. Her breasts had been severed. The size of her brassiere appeared to be inappropriate given the dimensions of her chest. The bra was still stuffed with paper towels. The police realized they had a serial killer on their hands. The hard part was tracking him down with so little evidence besides the bodies. They analyzed the wire, rope, and auto parts that were used to weight the bodies down. The materials were found to be the type used by electricians. The knots that were tied were also typical within the trade. Because Karen Sprinker was a student at Oregon State University, the detectives integrated the campus into the territory covered by their investigation. Their surveillance went on for weeks, but they came up with nothing. Finally, they unearthed an anomaly. A heavy-set, red-haired man with freckles was seen loitering on the campus grounds. He approached several girls and asked them for dates. There were two incidents wherein he tried to force students into his car. Stranger still, a man contacted a few of the female students on the telephone. He identified as a veteran of the war in Vietnam. He also told them he possessed extrasensory perception. He would conclude the call by asking them to join him for coke and conversation. Police were informed by two of the girls that they were contacted and turned him down feeling uncomfortable about the man and his proposal. One girl accepted the invitation. She told the detectives the name the man gave them was Jerry. She reported that their conversation was by turns awkward and sinister. She was not attracted to him because of his appearance and age. This didn't put her off as much as some of the things he said, such as, How did you know I would bring you back home and not take you to the river and strangle you? And, what makes you want to be raped like the other girls? And then there was, think something sad. Think about those two girls that were killed. That was an awful thing to have happen. He talked about the dead girls obsessively. That led to ruminations about the repair work he needed to do on the engine of his car. The girl wasn't exactly enticed into a second date. But she couldn't put their first date out of her mind either. She was too distracted by the alarm bells blaring in her mind. She called police. They told her that it sounded like he was the man that attacked Sharon Wood. They persuaded the girl to go on a second date if he called her again. A few weeks passed, and finally he called her. He apparently had no time to spare. He asked her to be ready in 15 minutes. She agreed initially, though she held him off for about an hour, telling him she needed that amount of time to get ready. Jerry agreed to this condition. After that call was ended, the girl called the police. They were waiting for her response. Jerry Brutal showed up to the location of the date, unaware of his rendezvous with the police. When they questioned him, 
He gave them his real full name. He told them his occupation was electrician. That fact aroused their attention. Brutus was not at all nervous. He was still confident that he covered all his tracks sufficiently. The police discovered his criminal record, which included incidents of the assault of a young girl and his stay at Oregon State Hospital. They suspected they had found the offender. Their next task was to take a closer look at his twisted psyche. The investigators visited his home. They learned by dint of examining the location that he was conveniently located to all the areas where the victims were abducted and discarded. Ropes and wires of the type used to bind the victims to car parts were found in the garage. A crime lab examined the ropes and wires and found that they were identical to the wires that were used to fasten the automotive parts to the bodies. Surveillance of Brutos and his property was put into place to prevent him from escaping or victimizing other women. The police obtained a warrant to search Brutos' car. The interior was washed thoroughly. In fact, it was still wet. Brutos told them his son left a window open as they drove through a car wash, but the detectives were skeptical. Though they were disappointed by the lack of DNA evidence, Gloria Smith, the 12-year-old Brutos tried to kidnap, picked him out of a photo lineup. This was some of the most damaging evidence yet. That, with the rope and wire evidence, gave them enough cause to arrest him. On May 30th, Jerry and Ralphine were heading toward the Canadian border. Police caught up with them. They believed he was trying to avoid prosecution. The surveillance team pulled him over. He had a gun in the car, incurring yet another charge. This wasn't the last of the surprises that day. When he was arrested, he was wearing silk panties. He told them they made him feel more comfortable. Jerry Brutus and his attorney resisted every effort made by the investigators to elicit a confession. He played mind games with Detective Jim Stovo. Stovo persisted. And finally, Brutos gave up every hideous detail. He was described as cold and unemotional as he described his crimes. He did become excited as he described his fetish for women's undergarments and footwear. The only occasion when he became morose was when he contemplated the lengthy prison sentence he had waiting for him. He also dreaded the financial hardship that was sure to afflict his family. At one point, he was asked if he cared about the four women he murdered. He grabbed a scrap of paper from the table, crumpled it up, and threw it on the floor. He said, That much. I care about those girls as much as I care about that piece of wadded up paper. June 1st, 1969. Assuming the police would show up at his house with a search warrant, Jerry Brudos called Ralphine and told her to burn everything that could be linked to the murders. He presumed that his normally submissive wife would follow this directive to the last letter. Brutos revealed more details about what he did to Jan Whitney. After strangling her to death with a leather strap, he climbed into the front seat. He had sex with her corpse. His lust was so overwhelming, it wouldn't tolerate a minute lost to dragging her remains into the garage. He only brought her there after his climax. Once there... She became the plaything of flesh and bone he most desired. He took photos of her in several outfits. He raped her body several more times before stringing her up on the hook and pulley device. He refused to disclose the location of the Willamette River where he dumped her body. He was so cocky, he figured they would never look. If he had been as knowledgeable about police investigations as he had been about electronics, he would have known that a dead body is not the only form of evidence needed to press charges. He told the story of what went down with Karen Sprinker. He described this incident. I was just driving around, and I saw this girl. She was wearing a mini skirt and high heels. It was about ten in the morning. I watched her, and she went into the store. The way she looked her clothing, and her shoes turned me on. I had to have her. Brutus parked and searched for the girl inside, but he was not successful in tracking her down. He described what happened next. I was walking back to my car when I saw the other girl. She had on a green sweater 
and a matching skirt. I didn't like her shoes, but she was a pretty girl with long, dark hair. I watched her as she locked her car and then came down the steps toward the door into the store. She reached to open the door, and I grabbed her by the shoulder. Brutos pointed his gun at her. He said, Don't scream, and I won't hurt you. Come with me, and I won't hurt you. Brutos was asked if Sprinker screamed anyway. Brutos said, Of course not. She said she would do whatever I wanted if I just didn't shoot her. She kept saying that several times, as if she was trying to convince me. I walked her to my car and put her inside. Jerry drove her to his house. His wife was visiting a friend, leaving Brutos with plenty of time and captivity to torture and kill Karen. He raped her. Sadly, she was a virgin, and Brutos extorted the privilege of planting his flag on that territory. If she hoped her first time would be special, she was no doubt unprepared for how tawdry and abusive it was. After violating Karen, Brutos ordered her to pose for photos wearing the garments of his choosing. Brutos described the final phase of this interaction. Then I put a rope around her neck. I had it attached to a come-along. I swung the rope up on the hoist, and it tightened around her neck. I asked her if it was too tight, and she said it was. I gave the come-along about three more pulls, and it lifted her off the ground. She kicked a little, and she died. His wife arrived at about this time. He went into the house and had dinner with his family. Having finished the evening meal, Brutos went back to the garage to rape Karen Sprinker's body again. Once he was finished, he cut off both of her breasts. He wanted to add to his resin-coated paperweight collection. As noted in the following statement, he was intent on improving the quality of these objects. I couldn't get the percentage of hardener right this time either, but they turned out a little better than with the girl from the freeway. When questioned about Linda Saley, he cleared up the mystery around the burn marks on her chest. He told the detectives he conducted an experiment in which he inserted two nails and linked them to an electrical source. He wanted to enhance his stimulation, and his wish was that the current of electricity would, quote, make it dance, end quote. He also said he wondered if it, quote, would jump like a frog in a skillet, end quote. June 2nd, 1969. For the death of Karen Sprinker, Jerry Brutos was charged with first-degree murder. The next step police took in the investigation was to obtain a search warrant to locate evidence of the other murders he committed. Anecdotal affirmation did not suffice. Ralphine did not completely honor Jerry's request to burn all articles of evidence, linking him to the crimes. She incinerated a couple of photographs as a perfunctory gesture, but those photos represented the tip of the tip of the iceberg of his pornographic portfolio. The police found the rest in a toolbox. The pictures were taken when the models were both pre- and post-mortem. District Attorney David M. Logan was quoted as saying, One was of Karen Sprinker while she was alive, standing, as I recall, without clothes, wearing only high heels, and the look on her face is a look you don't forget. Her hands were clenched in fists that spoke volumes about the fear and terror he had instilled in her. There were images of Jerry Brutos wearing female underpants as well. These did little to tilt the odds of prosecution away from his end of the spectrum. The other pictures of the victims would serve that function efficaciously, being that they were so acutely macabre. One woman was suspended from the come-along. A black hood was placed on her head. Another victim was photographed in several different outfits. Brutos cut the heads from many of the photos so that the victims couldn't be identified. Ultimately, Brutos hadn't always been that thorough. Initially, the police didn't realize what they were looking at when they examined the most incriminating image. One of the investigators urged another to focus on the bottom of the photo. Brutos used a mirror to procure a perspective of Jan Whitney's crotch, a perspective that would have been difficult to attain without the mirror. 
he failed to notice the inclusion of his own face in the image. This photo would provide the most damning item of evidence at his trial. The police also collected the cords, ropes, hook and pulley system, and Brudos' extensive collection of women's undergarments and shoes. The police didn't conclude this phase of the evidence gathering process in the garage. They made sure to search his home as well, and it paid off. When it occurred to one detective to brush his hand along the rear of the mantle, he found the paperweights Brudos made with Karen Sprinker's breasts. June 4, 1969. Jerry Brudos was arraigned for the murder of Karen Sprinker. He entered two pleas, not guilty and not guilty by reason of insanity. In order to determine whether he was certifiably insane, a team of psychiatrists were assigned to the case for the purpose of interviewing Brutos. Brutos was resolved to fool the psychiatrists into believing he was at the mercy of a disturbed mind and therefore incapable of committing the kinds of atrocities for which he was charged. He switched on the waterworks, crying about his emotionally neglectful mother, and the abuse she inflicted upon him while he was growing up. He said that when he left his family's home, he became detached from the world and could no longer relate to others without a deeply embedded undercurrent of rage. He also opined that his electrocution at work may be related, but they were aware that his abnormal sexual pathology predated the incident. Brutos was evaluated by seven psychiatrists in all and they all agreed that though he was antisocial and deviant, he was not psychotic. He didn't hear voices or experience any other kind of hallucination ordering him to commit the murders. They also confirmed through their systematic analysis that he knew right from wrong at the time he committed the murders. Their conclusion? He was a danger to society and impervious to rehabilitation. June 27, 1969 Facing irrefutable evidence, Jerry Brutos changed his plea to guilty on all three counts of first-degree murder. Judge Val D. Sloper addressed Brutos with the following statement. Jerome Henry Brutos, in case number 67640, in which you have pled guilty to the first-degree murder of Karen Elena Sprinker. It is the judgment of this court that you be committed to the custody of the Corrections Division of the Oregon State Board of Control for an indeterminate period of time, the maximum of which is the balance of your natural life. Jerry Brutos would spend no less than a minimum of 36 years in prison. He was not charged with Linda Slauson's murder because though he did confess to this act, her body was never recovered. Life in prison is seldom pleasant, but it became especially horrific for Jerry Brudos. Since his was a high-profile case that received significant media coverage, his fellow inmates were aware of the nature of his charges. This was bad news. Felons don't look kindly upon abusers of women and children. Also, in their view, his cross-dressing was a signifier of a passive and effeminate disposition, making him an even bigger target for violence. Brutos spent the first day of 1970 being treated in the infirmary for rectal bleeding. The cause given by prison officials was either hemorrhoids or some other cause, leading them to check the box marked as other. Jerry Brutos rang in the new year, toasting the incoming decade with a taste of his own medicine. As a distraction from the horrors of prison life, Brudos ordered and collected shoe catalogs, using them like pornography. He was attacked again in 1978. He was stabbed in the back in the cafeteria. The assailant didn't give a motive. Jerry Brudos's attempts to appeal his convictions and order new trials failed. He was also unsuccessful in convincing parole boards of his ability to assimilate as a law-abiding citizen in society. His lack of remorse for his crimes made that abundantly clear. The shoe catalogs didn't help either. March 28, 2006 At 5.10 a.m., 
Jerry Brudos perished due to complications of liver cancer. He was 67 years old, outliving the deceased among his victims by decades. Cindy Elliott, the younger sister of Jan Whitney, issued a statement following his demise. I'm feeling relief. I'm glad it's over. You hate to say you are glad that someone is dead, but my family believes it should have happened years ago. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.